Good evening. <laughs> if you can please turn with me to Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 20. But Daniel made up in his mind that he would not defile, taint, dishonor himself with the king's finest food or with the wine which the king drank. So he asked the commander of the officials that he might be excused so that he would not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has prearranged your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the young men who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the young men who eat the king's finest food be observed and, compa and compared by you and deal with your servants in accordance with what you see. So the man listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it seemed that they were looking better and healthier than all the young men who were in the king's finest food. Sorry, my contacts are going a little blurry on me, so mm. <laughs> having a hard time seeing. Uh, so in some other translations, it actually says uh, fatter, that they were fatter than all the young men who ate the king's finest food. So I thought that was interesting. Healthier, fatter. So the overseer continued to withhold their fine food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all kinds of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood all kinds of visions and dreams. At the end of the time set by the king to bring all the young men in before him, the commander of the officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king spoke with them and among them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, so they were selected and assigned to stand before the king and enter his personal service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the learned magicians and enchanters in the whole realm. Oh, Holy Spirit, we just, we thank you for this word. We thank you um, for Daniel's resolve. We thank you for how you moved in his life and how you gave him compassion and favor. We thank you for this example to learn from, Lord. And we, I ask that you speak through me and that we will learn together and grow together in this word and hear what you want us to hear and see what you want us to see in this scripture in Jesus' name. And about seeing it, if you touch my contacts, that I'll be able to <laughs> see clearly. Okay, and if not, I'll... That's fine. The Holy Spirit uh, <laughs> will empower me. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little brief history of Babylon. Uh, the setting where Daniel was located, it was the city to be in. I mean, it was the top place for education, the top place for economics. Everybody went here for trade and commerce. And he was considered Nebuchadnezzar the Great. He ruled Babylon. He conquered Jerusalem in 597 BC. He was the dominant world power of that day. His, uh, he had temples, he had palaces. There was a gate called Ishtar, which was, was full of, uh, there was fortifications behind it. There was uh, bulls and dragons that were colorful and in this time the col to have color in anything was a big deal I mean it meant you were really wealthy but there was rows and rows of bulls and dragons and with colored enameled brick around his throne room and around the city which meant great wealth um, they were called Chaldeans they dominated and ruled Babylon they were highly skilled 
in science, the science of astronomy, and the pseudoscience of astrology. Babylon was the capital city, and it, it was a very coveted place. Everybody wanted to go here and visit. And, and he was just conquering the world. Nebuchadnezzar was hitting one city after the next, and then, uh, then he got to Jerusalem. But the scripture says, if we back up a little bit, in Daniel uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it actually says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So King Nebuchadnezzar was this amazing, powerful world leader and power. But the scripture tells us who is ultimately in control, and that was the Lord. And he gave Judah, King Jehoiakim king, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. And while he was there, he was looking for the sons of Israel. And he picked up Daniel, and as we know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, that was their name they were giving later. Um, they were among the skillful, youthful men that he picked up to educate for three years in Babylon, to feed them so they can join in on the feast, to serve the king, to serve him. He wanted the best of the best, and he, he selected them, picked them out. And so this is the setting. So here's Daniel in the middle of this, someone who, who loves the Lord, someone who wants to serve the Lord. In Daniel 1.8, it says, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile, taint, or dishonor himself with the king's finest food or with the wine which the king drank. So he asked the commander and the officials that he may be excused and not defile himself. So I just want to revisit this. So here's Daniel in this setting. But it says that he made up his mind. And I went into the Hebrew on this scripture. What does this mean he actually made up his mind? And it says in Hebrew, in his inner man, not only his mind, but his will and his heart. He made up his mind, it was in his will, it was in his very heart, that he was not going to defile himself. And defile in the Hebrew means become impure. He, and different, different versions translated differently. Some say he resolved within himself, which means he made a decision. The uh, Amplify, which we read, said he made up his mind. The King James Version says he purposed in his heart. I really like that one. The CEB says he decided. So he resolved, he made up his mind, he purposed in his heart, he decided that he was not going to become impure. He was not going to defile himself. So, like, well, what's wrong with the king's fruit? Like, like why can't he feast on it? Like, why does he have to eat vegetables and water? And like, like, you know, I mean, like, hey, I mean, uh, it, it, it was it, it was where he was living in this this place of plenty, and and you know, wh when I went into deeper into that too, in the history and the commentaries, this wasn't just a feast. This wasn't just meat and wine. A, a, a lot of this food was sacrificed to idols. So. By him participating in the feasting and the drinking, he was, a, a lot of them believe that he was saying that these gods, these idols were real gods, and, and it was giving them honor. So he knew that the Lord Jehovah was the only God, and so he didn't want to participate in that because that was idolatry to him, and that was dishonoring the God of gods and the Lord of lords. So it was beyond just feasting and drink and food. It was what it meant. So he made up his mind. And I, I just want to ask you, my fellow seminarians, <laughs> what is your feast? What is, what is your temptation? What, what, it may, what is it that is appealing to the eye that that we could possibly compromise. We can say, well, our culture indulges in it. You know, everyone in America indulges in it. Everyone else is doing it. You know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't the only ones pulled out of Israel, but they were the only ones who made that decision to not defile themselves. They purposed in their heart. They decided in their mind and their, their, their very will was, 
ahead of time that they were not going to defile themselves. The difference between these four and the rest of them were they decided ahead of time that they were, they were going to do this. They purposed in their heart. So what is spread out before us? Oh, you know, I can get, I can just get divorced. Maybe I can get divorced again. Or is it, you know, everyone else is sleeping with their boyfriends. Why can't I? You know, everyone else is doing it. Um, maybe we'll just move in together because it's, you know, everyone else is doing it in my culture. Um, you know, everyone else swears, you know, what's the big deal? Maybe I'll just, you know, <laughs> lay an F-bomb now and then. What's the big deal? Everyone else is doing it. I mean, even pastors in the church, I hear, say it sometime. I mean, like, what? I think we all have a different feast, you know. What what is our temptation? What is what is what is the thing that could be tempting us that can defile us? It says in First John two sixteen, for all that is in the world, the lust and sensual craving of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life pretentious confidence in one's resources or the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I know when I was a, a youth myself, uh, one of my mentors told me, those are the three things, Mary. Make sure you, well, everything falls under those three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three things. I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, but what does that mean? Um, actually, what does that mean? I, I found a commentary that I really liked what it said, Matthew Henry commentary. He says, the lust of the flesh is of the body, wrong desires of the heart, the appetite of indulging in all things that excite and inflame sensual pleasures. The lust of the eyes. The eyes are delighted with riches and rich possessions. This is the lust of covetous covetousness. Or the pride of life. A vain man craves the pomp of vain glorious life this includes thirst after honor and applause unless this victory over the world is begun in our heart a man has no root in himself but will fall away or at most remain an unfruitful person yet these vanities are all alluring to the corruption in our hearts that without constant watching and prayer we cannot escape the world or obtain victory over the God and Prince of it that's Matthew Henry. So I pray, Lord, help me to make up my mind. Help me decide the purpose in my heart ahead of time that I will not defile myself with this world. Help me to recognize my own temptations, whatever these feastings are that are enticing, and decide ahead of time that I'm going to keep myself pure. And if I do, there's less of a chance I'll fall into it. Doesn't mean we won't, but there's less of a chance because we're on top of it. So this, this makes me think of when I first moved out here and being in the entertainment industry, I, I uh, always had a calling on my, on my heart, on, on my life since I was five years old to be in the industry. But I, I also have other talents and gifts and I love doing film and television. and. I came out here and was told that this man can help you and and he was a manager of some really big stars and so I'm like okay well let me see what he has to say and I went to his mansion in the Hollywood Hills and he one of the first things he asked me is if you could have anything to eat what would it be what's your favorite meal said, well lobster not knowing he was gonna buy it <laughs> So to the mansion, he orders from a Beverly Hills restaurant, top notch, five star. Uh, I swore the receipts at $650. No exaggeration, no kidding. Plus a tip on top of that. So I'm like, okay, well, this is great hospitality, you know, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but he was definitely trying to impress me, and that was the beginning of it. Um, long story short, he made me a proposition. He said if I was his girlfriend, that he would make me a star by the end of the year, just like he did these other two famous people. If I said their names, you would know them. Um, 
he gave me a Rolex watch. I gave it back. <laughs> gave me a leather jacket. It was really nice. It fit me perfectly. Gave it back. Uh, gave me a hundred bucks. I kept that. I thought I should get something for my trouble. <laughs> Used it for gas. Um, and, you know, and, I, and he said to me, you know, he, he gave me this promise. Whether he could keep it or not, maybe he could, maybe, maybe, maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. But the thing is, is he knew I, I came out with hardly no nothing. Um, I came from a background uh, where I grew up pretty poor. And so this was really enticing. Money, fame, you know, just like that, you know. And, but I purposed in my heart, I can say, before I moved out to Hollywood, I purposed in my heart way back a long time ago. And I said to the Lord, and I, I not only said it to the Lord, but I said it to my family, and I said it to my friends before I came up to Hollywood, and I said this, I will never sell my soul. If I get anywhere in the entertainment business or in life, it's because the Lord brought me there, and it's because I got there the right way. And if I don't get there the right way, I'm not going to get there at all. And I said that so many times. If I don't get there the right way, I'm not getting there at all. If I don't get there the right way, I'm not getting there at all. Over and over and over. I purposed in my heart. I made up my mind, made my decision. I'm not selling my soul. No matter how much people told me, oh, there's temptations, or oh, they're going to stick needles in you, in you. You're going to end up in a sex trafficking. Or I'm like, you know what? I'm in the Lord's hands. I'm setting my heart to seek the Lord. And uh, he called me a fool. He said I was a foolish girl. He said that I was, he said, I'm offering you a shortcut. You're a foolish girl. You're going about it the long way. I'm, he literally said, I'm offering you a shortcut. You're a fool. And I said, you know what? If I don't get there the right way, I'm not getting there at all. So when the temptation hit me, the feast, the mansion, the money, the fa everything, the feast was before me. I said what I was saying all along. If I don't get there the right way, I'm not getting there at all. And I walked out of that mansion. He called me and called me from three different numbers and um, never went back. I never went back. And I, I haven't always been perfect in my life, you know. I haven't always <laughs> done the right thing. But I can say that time I did. Because I purposed in my heart. I love the Lord, and I'm going to get there the right way. Or I'm not getting there at all. So in closing, I just want to say, uh, Lord Jesus, I ask that you touch my friends, you touch my fellow seminarians today, that we will make up in our mind, we will decide a purpose in our heart ahead of time, that we will not defile ourselves in this world. And when the feasts are set before us, that we will flee temptation and that we will keep our hearts pure in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Thank you very much Keep praying Keep praying